Welcome to the Brand Theory Podcast, the podcast for helping you uncover your passion, realize your purpose, and take the aligned action. Together, we're going to prove the theory that when we live our lives on brand, the possibilities become limitless. I'm your host, Jenny Marchesi, branding expert and business coach. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Brand Theory Podcast. Today we have a super exciting episode with Sarah Thompson, a very fierce wedding photographer and educator who believes in giving a damn in life and business. She served hundreds of clients through photography and wants to show the next generation of photographers and business owners how to serve their clients well while creating a sustainable business. During this in-depth conversation about business and life, we touch on what authenticity really is and why chasing social media is not always where you should be spending your time. Let's get into this episode. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, so good to be here. I'm so happy this worked out. And I, so guys, as a little background, um, we are both part of a system called Podmatch, and it's basically like Tinder for podcasting. And you can choose to pass or to accept a match. Um, and I saw Sarah's profile and I knew right away that I had to message her and get her on. And it was like, boom, 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 we're booked. And I think we had to wait, what, like three weeks for the appointment, but we're here. I'm so excited to chat and just dive into all the things. And my biggest question, probably we're going to start off first is tell us about your journey thus far, kind of who you are. I know we heard about you in your intro, but in your own words, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, I'm currently a wedding photographer and educator here in the Seattle area. My photography journey started when I was 16, um, in high school, I needed an art credit and my dad just happened to have an old camera laying around and I was like, "Ugh, okay, I guess I'll take photography. So I ended up taking photography, loved it. Um, I will fully admit I was not great at it and I took it all four years of high school. Um, and when I got to my senior year, I told my parents, I'm like, Oh, I really want to be a photographer. And they were like, no, you're going to go to college and get a real job. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Especially when my college tuition was on their dime. So um, I happily, well, not happily, I obliged. And then because I had done running start as a high school student where you can earn college credit in the high school, I transferred to my university with over a hundred credits. So I really only had two years left at university. And then I used that extra tuition money to go back to art school. So I made my parents happy, but I also went to pursue what I wanted. Um, in the program, it was a commercial photography program. You have to have an internship. And in the internship, I ended up interning for a wedding studio. Ironically, I thought I was going to be a product photographer, go shoot in LA, like do all this other stuff. And nope, I ended up falling in love with documenting people. And that's how I got to the career path that I'm on. And I've been shooting now full time for six years, but but I shot my first wedding in 2013. And I was doing a couple of other jobs in the commercial industry, but then I really decided working for myself was not only best suited for my talents, but also for my personality. I really like to be in charge of my own ship. And so it's just been really fun. My husband totally had full faith in me and that's how I got to where I am today. Amazing. I love that. So remind us again, how long you've kind of been out on your own as a wedding photographer. So I've been full-time for myself for six years. Okay. So tell us about, I want to get into all the wedding things in a bit. Cause I just got engaged. So I have a ton of questions, <laughs> but oh girl, open book over here. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> But I want to talk about how you kind of built this business for yourself and what that was like. Were you nervous to go out on your own coming from a background of parental figures who maybe weren't so into it at the time, even though you got the education and all that good stuff. So kind of what was it like to start going out on your own? It was absolutely terrifying because what had happened was I was a producer at a major studio here in Seattle and I got put under a new boss. And that boss decided I wasn't a part of her vision. And so I got fired after coming home from my honeymoon. And so I came home freshly married. Yep. Around Christmas time, no job, no job. And I was just like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And so um, I was talking to my husband about it over probably the umpteenth bottle of wine while sitting in the tub. And he's like, well, you're really good at the photography thing. Like, why don't you just keep like, instead of side hustle, I just don't you do it. And I was like, 
okay, I guess I can do it. So literally January 1st, 2017 was like, all right, we're going to make this side hustle into a real business. So, um, in the Washington area, we have a very distinct wedding season. It's usually May through October. So I was starting this in January. I did not have a long runway and I literally just started posting anywhere, talking to anyone that like, I'm now a wedding photographer, like hire me. Are you engaged? Do you need new headshots? And it was just, how can I get the most work as quickly as possible? I immediately went into building a website. I like invested in a ton of like templates and things to make like brochures and to make magazines and to like formulate a price list and to get a contract. And because I had worked for a small business already, I kind of knew all the pieces that needed to be lined up to be able to really process a client. Um, so I wasn't, it wasn't like a fish out of water. Like I kind of had a feel for what needed to happen, but when you're doing it for yourself, it's absolutely terrifying and also thrilling. Um, I also had a connection to my old Starbucks boss. She ended up being becoming a full-time wedding photographer years after I went to art oh, school. She started her business. Yeah. So I reconnected with her because while I was in school, she was building her business. And I was like, hey girl, hey, I am <laughs> totally trying to get in this industry. Like, can I intern for you? Can I second shoot for you? Like, what can I do? And what was really great was, um, my best friend was getting married and she was on a super tight budget. So I was like, Hey friend, can I gift these other friends their wedding photography by working for you to make up that money? Like, can I like be the, the gift card, if that makes sense. And she was like, yeah, that works. And I was like, okay. So I got to like basically second shoot for her for an entire summer and then at the end of that, she was building um, an associate business. So it's like an associate inside of a wedding photography company is someone who comes in and they just shoot on the day of the wedding. They hand the cards over to the main photographer. The main photographer has done all the correspondence, contracts, everything. And you basically, you're just a contractor. And so she asked me to be her first first shooter. And I was like, what? Amazing. So not only did I have her guidance for the first summer of like, what does this industry even look like right now? Um, then I got to work for her company and she was so generous and kind with teaching me, like being very knowledgeable. It was very clear between the two of us that I was here to learn, to work really hard for her business, to help her build an associate team. And then I would later leave to do my own thing, like on like full time. So while I was doing that, I was also building my business. So when my little baby grew up, <laughs> I got to leave her with a really great framework to build her team, which is now six photographers. And then I got to build my own business, which fully stands on its own. So it was definitely not, the plane was not built alone while I fell out of the sky. Like I had a lot of help. And I think that's something that's super unique about our Seattle industry is there are so many wedding vendors who are just so kind and generous and there's enough work to go around. So people are happy to teach, happy to share, happy to lift you up and help you grow. And I think I was just very, very fortunate to have those connections in my life. Um, and I think something that is, should be said is like in, for anyone who's listening to this, if you have those connections, like it's kind of like having a gym membership. If you never go, you're never going to get stronger. So if you never reach out to your contacts, you're never going to go beyond what you are right now. So take advantage of whoever's around you. Cause I know it absolutely changed my life. Mm, that's so true. And it seems like perfect timing, right? Like all the kind of stars align, but you're right. Like you totally use those connections that you built and why not use them? They're there for a reason. Love that. Exactly. Exactly. And so it was kind of a perfect storm. Just like you said, we made yeah. it out alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy you did. <laughs> so one of the biggest things that attracted me to want to chat with you is you're saying to not chase social media. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey of building your business through social media, how you utilized it and how you got to this conclusion of we should not be chasing social media? Yeah, I think like any other business owner, like social media platforms are free for the most part. And so it's like, it's great advertising. Everyone's on them. You can reach new people. But what happens is like, that is an entire audience that at no point whatsoever, should you trick yourself into believing you are in charge of. So companies have algorithms because why we are their product. So for them, they're running a business and our data is the product. So they're changing algorithms to get the most out of us. They're not here to help you build your business whatsoever. <laughs> like they're here to build their business. If 
if you happen to get be lucky, then great. They'll they'll use your story to make other business owners also come because then that's more data for them. So I think once you have like a bigger picture of like this is a business and I'm trying to build my little baby business under here, that just allows you to really let go of a lot of the woes that is like crying over the algorithm changes, having low engagement and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was recently talking to my mastermind group about reels. And when you do those fun little silly dances and you have like the trending audio, yeah, you get a ton of views. You can get a lot of engagement, but have you gained any followers or any customers? No, you really haven't. But for people who create instead very authentic reels of like, here's some tips of how I run my business or as a bride, here's some things you should be thinking about for your wedding. Like that will get more authentic engagement and granted lower numbers, but you might actually make a real connection. And so I think what's the problem is, is like people just, we're always chasing these vanity metrics. Like we think that millions of followers is going to make us happy, fill the void, fill our paychecks, like all that stuff. And it's just not true. And when you think about no matter how big your following is or how many people engaged with something, imagine like taking a photo, standing in front of a stadium and being like, everyone look at my photo. (laughs) And then like thousands of people are like, yeah, that is what the internet is like. And we forget what it is like to think about a thousand people looking at you and looking at this thing that you made. Like that's Mm. terrifying. But for some reason on a phone, it's like never enough. So in a way, like, I think we shouldn't be chasing social media because social media has taken out the reality of like human engagement and what that means. Like if your work or your message hits one person and you change a life, like that's pretty revolutionary. And we've been fooled that it is never enough. And you've got to get the next person and the next thing and the next mountain and the next climb. And you're never, ever happy because you never get to the point where you're satisfied and content because you keep playing the game. So once you realize what the game is, then you can honestly just let it be a game and be fun because you have a business strategy over here. That's actually going to grow your business, get like pay the invoices buy like do whatever you want with your money, yeah. but like not over here. You got to be over here. <laughs> that. Yeah. Just a little speechless of that because that, that is everything that I've been trying to explain, or I guess comes to the conclusion of myself. Um, Cause I definitely get, I definitely have got caught up in the game and the followers and the likes and the engagement and all of that kind of stuff. But I would say this past year, I've kind of adopted the attitude of let me go back to teaching and let me not care about the likes and all that kind of stuff. Cause I never really truly cared about it, but you get caught up. I definitely get caught up in, in my profile has to look a certain way and I have to do this, but I'm in a sweatshirt all the time. Why am I, why am I going to try to fake it even with my looks on social media? If I can just come across as so authentic through my reels or through TikToks, through stories, through posts, that's what's going to resonate with the audience that I want to work with. So everything you said is a, a big yes, but how did you, was there something that happened that made you come to that conclusion or is that something you've always been really self-aware of? No, it distinctly happened for me during a workshop called All You Witness, and it's hosted by um, two wedding photography husband-wife teams, and then Wynn Wiley, who if you know Patagonia on, Mm -hmm. um, not the company, but Patagonia, the drag queen for the outdoors. Yeah, I do. (laughs) um, So that's Wynn Wiley. He also was a wedding photographer before he became Patty. And so he hosted this workshop with these two other couples. And we really, it's called All You Witness because what they did is we really, first of all, we showed up and they said, do not bring your cameras, do not bring your laptops, do not bring, leave your phones in your room. We are going unplugged. And so for a wedding photography retreat, that was like extremely abnormal, but we all show up. And what they did is we really broke down the history of wedding photography and what wedding photography really means. So the photos you're shooting are going to end up on someone's funeral page. They're going to end up on a deathbed where, you know, think like the notebook where he's, she's like lying in the bed and he like comes to her and it's like, maybe they had their wedding photo on the little end table. Like these photos are heirlooms and they are a family legacy for, for an event that of which you would have no other invitation other than to photograph and to document and to bear witness and to give back those memories to a couple to have forever. So this philosophy of like really understanding the heart of why we do what we do 
just made you see through all the crap. And what was amazing was we all like submitted three photos to have quote unquote critiqued. So people are like posting their favorite stuff and they're like, you know, you have a lot of pride and a lot of ego seeing your images up there in front of everyone. Cause you're like, oh yeah, I'm hot shit. But really, <laughs> um, what they did is they were like, yeah, this is a really trendy photo, but have you ever seen someone do this in real life? Like unprompted? Have you ever seen a couple do that? No, you haven't. And so it was, why are we manipulating our couple's stories for our own ego and our own arts purposes when really that's not them and we're not honoring who they truly are? Since that workshop, um, it really just changed my relationship with social media. Cause first of all, they made you delete Instagram from your phone for the week. So you had no contact and like, it was the most freeing experience. Like I connected like with the other photographers, like as people before I ever saw their work, their following, like what they're doing outside of like this small space in the middle of, of Colorado in the Rocky mountains. Like you really got to have this personal experience. And when I left and I looked up these people, I was like, holy, sh I was talking to that person. What? And I'm talking about people who photograph like celebrities. Like I was just like blown away. And what I realized is that social media is now the antithesis of what it was created for. We are not connecting on this thing. We are doing everything to just prop ourselves up because human beings are very egotistical. And that's also what's polluting my industry. So if I can be a small voice, it'd be like, Hey guys, let's get real on this thing. Um, and not be chasing that, not be in the game. I think that's just beneficial, not only to me, my work and my couples, but I think as like, you know, being the uncool kid in the cool kid click. I think that like, that is kind of what people are craving. Like we're sick and tired of like the fakeness and the curation and all that stuff. So yeah, that, that's, that was the pivotal moment for me when I realized what was the true depth of what I was doing. I love it. That's, it's such a good story. And I love how that it, it came from an experience of just human to human action. I say that all the time of if we can show up as humans in our social media, we're going to attract kind of like I was saying before, you're going to attract, you're more likely to attract an audience that knows you and wants to work with you for your likability for there's some, something that you said or some action you did, just you being you not talking about business that made them, oh, I want to be friends with them. Oh, I could actually work with her as a photographer. Oh, she's cool. She likes the same kind of coffee as me. Let me strike up a conversation. And it's not going to be right for everybody, but if we can show up as our most most, and I really don't like using the word authentic because it's a killed buzzword now, but Over as our most, our most authentic self through that social, all of the social media platforms that you choose to be on, you're going to get the results that you want to be seeing rather than trying to keep up with the trends and getting those, sure, the likes and the bump and engagement, but what is it actually doing for you? So I love that you came to that conclusion in a very cool way of being in a room of, of really cool people, it sounds like. It was, um, it was pretty wild. Yeah, I love that. So how do you market yourself right now? So you use social media, but do, what do you use other things and how do you use social media currently? So currently I'll start with how do I use social media? So I really, I post very infrequently and it's usually only when I have new work and I'm like excited about like the shoot that I got to do. So you'll see I get the time of this recording. I just posted like an engagement session and I just had a really great time with the couple, picked a couple photos, threw them up there. Um, but it's not something that I do every day. It's not something that like, I like stress over and cry over. Um, but I really find that I connect a lot more with people in stories. And so for me, it's literally just getting on there and being like, yo, this is what's going on. This is what happened yesterday. Or talking about real, like current events, like currently in our country, we have a lot of issues going on a and lot. And it's really devastating. And I think it's really important that as business owners, people need to know our values. And um, because I know I wouldn't want to give money to someone who didn't align with my values. So I talk very openly about what's happening in the world, what my stance is on it. And if it calls for it, I give people resources. I'm like, hey, you might not know who to call right now to voice your opinion about gun control, but here's Patty Murray's office number. Like go talk to her. Like she's your representative here in Washington. And so I think it's just really important to use the platform in a real way. So for me, like that's, what's on my mind. That's what I'm going to talk about. And um, in terms of other marketing, I am a firm believer in relationships. So 
not only do I show up on a wedding day and I work for my couple, I also take care of family. I also take care of like the other guests there and be really personable and engaging. And you know what? Like if aunt so-and-so really wants a photo with the bride's mom and all of her siblings, then I'm going to make it happen because that little honoring of their story will serve me so much longer than anything else I do that day. So that auntie might see one or two other photos that I take that day, but she's going to be hunting in that gallery for that photo because that meant a lot to her. So for me, it's like, how can I serve your family as well? Because if the couple is super hyped about a photographer, but that photographer is a dick to everyone else at the wedding, because mm-hmm. they're just focused with their ego and their art and doing the couple stuff that is not going to serve them long-term and that's going to catch up with them. But I can tell you that like being a great person and a kind person and a generous person on the wedding day, no matter how stressful what's happening with the weather, (laughs) anything else that's gone wrong, it just takes you so much further. So word of mouth has been an incredible marketing tool for me. And then I do have an email list. So on my website, a popular thing that I do every season is mini sessions because a lot of my couples grow up and they make families and they want photos of those families. So I don't do a ton of individual family sessions, but I do do many, many session days where that's, you pick one location, you shoot for like six hours back to back to back with all your family couples and they get like 20 or 30 minutes with you. And it's the perfect amount of time, honestly, for little ones. Cause that's about mm-hmm. the size of their attention span at that point. Um, and so email marketing word of mouth and like a little bit of social media, that's about it. I don't, I stopped doing, um, Google ads, just because right now we're in the really heavy booking season for Seattle wedding. And so it's like the cost per click is really, really high. So I'm like, "Eh, we're going to, I, it tends to be a balance. Like I'll lean on things that I know will work a lot better than others, given the time frame of the year and knowing that I typically book out 12 to 18 months. So in this six to 12 months, I don't really need a ton of extra weddings. I've almost fully booked for the next two years. So I really can kind of like pump the brakes and not overspend on my ads. And so as a business owner, the the more years that you do this, the more you're going to learn that about your business, the ebbs and flows and what actually works and what doesn't. And I think what's hard is people are like, oh, well, what do you do? Because you're so successful. And it's like, it's the same with social media. I just found what worked for me. And I think that that is a really hard pill to swallow because everyone just wants the magic formula and they don't realize that they are the magic formula. Like what works for you? What feels authentic to you? Like do you want to get up and make reels every day and learn a new TikTok dance? I don't know if it works for you, that it works for you. Um, but that's just not going to be my jam. Yeah. You, the last part of what you're saying is what I was planning on saying is I think there's this experimental phase that you go through in the first couple of years of, okay, what do I do? Do I have to be on all the platforms? Okay. Let me try it. And then you find what works and what doesn't, but not necessarily to beat the algorithm. It's what works and what doesn't for you, like your energy and where you kind of are comfortable comfortably uncomfortable, let's say, because it's good to kind of push mm-hmm. yourself a little bit. But yeah, I, I I fully believe in doing what works for you, but taking that time to kind of trust your gut and your intuition about what is going to work for you because you actually like it. Because if you like what you're doing in your marketing, you're going to be more excited to, to get up there and do it. And if that's posting two times a week, then that's what it does. But there's going to be the best two posts a week <laughs> that you've ever done. Um, when you're talking about, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add, um, I should also say that SEO is a really big tool because it's free. It is $3 and you can build up your website. Um, and so one little hack for wedding photographers particularly is, um, I know that a lot of like wedding magazines will want you to advertise with them, which is cool. But if you submit a wedding to get published, that is usually free. And they link to your website and that builds a backlink to your site and you didn't have to pay for anything. So like there's little tricks and hacks of like, okay, I want, I want this connection, but like, I don't want to pay for it. And so, and I think that that's justifiable because small businesses, we do not have big ad spend anyway. Um, so there's like things like, as you learn the ropes of your industry, whichever industry you are in, like try to find those free things to do first, because if you can build those really highly, 
again, that's something that you're in charge of. You have control over. Like, like I know what's on my blog. I know what's on my website. I know what keywords I'm targeting. I know who I'm attracting. Um, but if like the people who I paid to advertise on their website totally change and then they have my money and it's now advertising to things I don't want, I don't have control over that. So for me, as an Enneagram type one Virgo perfectionist, I say, keep as much control as you can. <laughs> I agree with that as well. So when you were talking about taking the pictures of Auntie that she requested, um, what popped into my head is this creating this kind of one of a kind brand experience. Yes, for your couples, but for the families and everybody involved. And a lot of people listening may not be wedding photographers, but a lot, most are service-based businesses. Can you talk a little bit about what you do? And that was kind of one example, but what else you could do or suggest to- um, I'm so sorry, that was my cat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's okay. We're all, all the pets here. Bring her on, bring them on. <laughs> um, can you suggest what else to do to kind of create a very unique brand experience that's unforgettable and then kind of keeps people referring you out? Yeah, I think um, there's a little bit of timing that goes into it and then just a lot of heart. So as long as you really care about what you're doing and who you're doing it for, that authenticity is just going to shine through no matter what. So for me, um, part of my unique brand experience as an example is the day after a wedding, I've imported all the images and I always do what I call a mega preview. And so it's usually at least a hundred images that I edit right away. And it's from all parts of the day that get delivered to the couple within 48 hours of their wedding because they're on this high of like, oh my gosh, this just happened. This is so crazy. I hope we got a good photo. And then when you just hand that right to them and it's theirs to post, share, send, do whatever they want, that puts them on cloud nine in the sense of like, wow, what a great service. I didn't have to wait. These are high quality. I'm so excited. And it just makes them feel so confident in their investment in you. And the same thing is like, if I know that particular family members asked for a certain photo at that wedding, I put that in the preview. Mm. So they know that I'm thinking about them. So that's an extra little like, Ooh, Sarah thought about us. And then at the end of my like timeline of working with my couple. So I've sent the, I've sent the, um, final gallery. It's now time for me to ask for a very nice review. Hopefully Um, I send them a personalized thank you gift. So it's like, thank you for investing in me. Thank you for inviting me to this day. Thank you for trusting me with this day. And you know, just those extra touches of not just like being like, all right, there's your gallery. Bye. Like keeping up with them. Like I keep up with my couples on social media. I hype them up. Like if they have a baby announcement, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so excited for you two to make a human, like anything you can do to just have that personal interaction. And once you realize that you're doing that again, it comes back to that bringing the numbers back into reality. I have between 30 and 50 couples every year. So I'm talking about like a hundred people a year. I'm adding to my roster of who am I keeping up with? And so like that adds up very quickly over time. So you just want to like realize that like that's a whole job of just keeping up with people, but it also serves you. So the couple that I just shot on Monday that I posted on my Instagram, they're a referral from a bride who I had two years ago. And so it's really fun to just like do that. Um, Another thing about creating a unique brand experience is just, again, what like you have to like always turn inwards, always listen inwards. Like what speaks authentically to you. Like, would you send someone like a mug with coffee in it? Like, is that your jam? Do you love coffee? Do you know that they love coffee? Like, is that what you're going to be doing? Or are you the person that's going to like make them a surprise album and send that to them? It's just about a, what works with your budget and then B what works with your personality because they hired you for your personality. Um, and again, that comes down to experimentation, like what works, what doesn't, there's just like no simple answer besides like to look inwards, reflect and figure it out for yourself. I love that. And there's no right answer either. I I love what you're saying of it goes really tie in with your personality. Like what can you wrap in with your brand, with what you know about their story to put that extra personal touch on that. So I love that. So I'd love to transition into dishing about weddings. (laughs) Oh, girl. We got the stories for you. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. So for a brief, brief, brief amount of time, when I was my last year in college and for a little bit after that, I worked for a wedding planner as like an executive assistant. I did everything from fielding phone calls to booking caterers and site visits and anything that they needed. I just kind of filled it. 
I loved it, but I knew it wasn't my jam, but she's actually a huge part of my story because she was a woman owned business that she was doing for 30 plus years by the time I was working with her. And it was so I, you could see the passion on her face. Right. And I didn't have that. And I knew I had to go find that. So anyway, all that to say, I know a little bit about the wedding industry and how it can be like this crazy over the top thing or super intimate. Um, and in my search for photography, and I've literally just started, I, I, you know, don't really have, I don't have a date yet. I don't have a place booked. I don't have any of that kind of stuff. But the one thing I know I do not want is like a cheesy photographer. And I'm not saying the photographer is cheesy. I'm saying like the results are those typical wedding albums that our parents had so cute for them, but I don't like that. So what do you suggest for anybody who's struggling with this too, of what to look for when searching for a wedding photographer? Oh man, how much time do you got? No, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think first of all, uh, the fact that you've identified the way that you want to feel on your wedding day and the results you want to have is already a really great place to start. You're like, I do not want my album to look like it came from the eighties. So sorry, mom, or even the nineties where things yeah. got a little weird. Um, we want to keep it really authentic and really beautiful. And the good news is, is that the current wedding industry is very much into storytelling, like authentic storytelling. So that's where you get things that look a lot more cinematic instead of just like, a happy snap from like an iPhone. So what I would say is from that point, I think it's really important to go exploring. So not just on Instagram, because Instagram um, is going to be an algorithm that's already catered to other things that you've liked. Um, I suggest looking at major publication sites, such as Junebug Weddings, Green Wedding Shoes, Martha Stewart Weddings, and Carrots and Cake. There's a bunch of them out there. If you look up for the top wedding websites outside of the Knot and the Wedding Wire, i that's a whole other story. Um, but looking for these specific publications allows you to be exposed to a lot of different styles very quickly. And something that I always encourage couples to hone in on is, do you like the moodier, darker images, or do you like the lighter, airier ones? Because those are two different ways of shooting and two different ways of editing. If you like the way someone shoots, like you just are really drawn to like the expressions that you see, the composition that you see, make sure you're looking at the color palette as well. Because photographers, we are very much sticklers about our editing because that is part of our style and our artistry. So it's really important that those two things align, actually three things. So personality, edit style, and shooting style. Um, so that's what I would do is I would first expose myself and see what I like, or maybe go to your Pinterest board that you've maybe been creating and, you know, loving and just kind of notice what sort of images are you pinning? Cause that's easily what you're already drawn to. Um, and then what I would say is honing down to like maybe a top 10 going through their websites personally and like read their about me, read the verbiage on their website, because most of the time people talk or people write the way that they talk. So if you're like kind of jiving with a personality, be like, yeah, this is really cool. Then from there, maybe look at their Instagram. See, are they on their stories? Do they have reels? Do they have like informational videos? Because like, that's a really easy way to kind of be a deep creeper and like get to know their personality a little bit better before you reach out. Um, always consider your budget when it comes to falling in love with someone, because if you have a $3,000 budget, but you fall in love with a $10,000 person, that's going to be a really big, like bridge to gap or gap to bridge. Wow. I have such great words today. Um, <laughs> and so just really being mindful of those things. Um, so it's kind of like a little bit all at once, you kind of need to be considering these factors all together and then really having the one-on-one -on -one interviews with at least three photographers, because you want to ask them things about like their contract, ask, how do you work with me and, and my spouse? How are you going to work with our families? Um, what happens if you can't make it that day? What about COVID? What about like, it's really important to just get all of those questions answered. Um, typically if you do ask kindly for it, I know I'm willing to share a contract with someone prior to them even agreeing to sign just so they can read through it and feel really confident in it. I also say that I'm an open book and they can ask me anything. So as long as you have someone who's really willing to connect with you and answer all those hard questions, that's someone who's really willing to work with you about your stuff. Um, and then just again, continuing to ask for maybe full gallery. Galleries. Um, I think there are some photographers who 
pick and choose what they share. So they cherry pick their best images, but maybe they're an incredible portrait photographer, but they aren't very good at details or at family photos. And that is a big part of your wedding day. So asking for full galleries is also very important. So you get a, you know, what a full wedding day looks like from this photographer. Love that. That's such great advice. Thank you. (laughs) And as clients, what are some things we should definitely not do? Do you have any worse client stories that you could share with me to to not do? (laughs) I mean, I will say I've been very lucky. I have been very lucky. Um, I do not have a lot of bridezilla stories whatsoever. Um, But I think some things that become red flags as clients to your photographer is a asking for all of the images, AKA all the raw files. A raw file is basically when we take a photo, that's the thing that's written onto our SD card. And that file is not a completed piece of art. And what your photographer does is we take hours to go through the thousands of photos that we've taken of your wedding day and we get rid of all the bad ones. So that unflattering angle that you were really worried about, we may have accidentally snagged it and it would be nightmarish if we sent it to you. And we don't want you to have that image of yourself on your wedding day. We want you to see the best of the best. So don't ask for the raw files. You're probably not going to get them and you really don't want them. And you probably don't even have the software to process them. Um, two, asking the person to change their contract for you, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. unless is it is an extenuating circumstance, which is very, very rare. Um, a contract is in place to protect us and to protect you. And so just the same way you can't go to iTunes and be like, Hey, can you change your terms and agreements for me? It's really easy to want to do that to a small business because it's one person, but it's really, it, kind of starts off on the wrong foot because then we feel like you're going to be Nikki or like nitpicky about everything else down the line. Um, and then I would say, talk to your photographer about the photos you've been dreaming of, but please do not provide a shot list of 200 images. A lot of the things that you're thinking of, we already take care of. So you don't need to write down ring boxes, photo of the bride and groom photo of the bride with her mom, photo of the groom with his dad. Like that is all very standard. Um, we want to know about the very unique things that you want to shoot. So it's like, do you have a niece who's like the light of your life and you babysit her every weekend? And she's just like a a daughter to you. That's what I want to know because that is unique to your story. Um, so yes, um, you can leave the shot list at home. We totally got you. You're more than welcome to share a Pinterest board. I will look at it. I will see what you're drawn to and incorporate that style into what I shoot for you that day. Um, And then just being really communicative with your photographer. I think on the day of your wedding, things are going to go wrong. They always do nothing major. And so just let it go. At that point, you need to be Elsa, let it go. Cause you're, (laughs) the day is rolling on without you. And so I think my couples who are incredible planners, but also have a very chill attitude about things that could happen on the wedding day, always get the best results because they're like, Hey, we did all we could. And you know what? Anything that goes wrong is just going to be a great story later on. Yeah. Okay. I got it. I don't think I'm, I'm not really the bridezilla type, but I don't think uh, any red flags will pop up with my photographer. So thank you for that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh. Of course. So as we wrap up here, um, do you have any last pieces of advice for just kind of fellow business owners who are building up or just anything in general, last thoughts that you want to share with us and tell us where we can find more of you and maybe share a bit about that mastermind that you have as well? Yeah. So I would say last minute things to really think about when we're trying to deviate our minds from thinking about these vanity metrics of social media is not only do you need to turn inwards to find out what authentically speaks to you as a business owner when using these platforms, but instead of focusing on vanity metrics, start focusing on the actual metrics of your business. What does the business health look like for you? Um, How many clients are you trying to take on? Are you meeting deadlines? Do you have a savings account? Do you have a retirement account? Like when it comes to tax season, are you like struggling or hiding in the closet? Yeah. And so I think when people really stop focusing on the things that do not bring you money, but start focusing on your money, it can be absolutely revolutionary because I think what happens is in our culture, we have been taught not to talk about money. And that was very strategic of businesses to say, do not talk to anyone about your paycheck because they were paying people different rates. 
And therefore, if everyone's in the dark, no one knows it's the big secret. Hello, uh, gender wage gap. So <laughs> when you can get really familiar with your money and start talking to your partner or to fellow colleagues about like, Hey, what are your rates for this? Like, what is your retirement plan? And just having like open candid conversation, I think has the ability to destigmatize the money talk and to really bring power to the individual so they can make really great decisions when it comes to their business. Like, can you invest in this new equipment? Should you be hiring an online business manager? Do you need a VA? What is the difference between those? All those types of things. Um, Because that's where you really get to make the big needle moves in your business is when you can make empowered decisions around your money, because those are the metrics that matter. Um, If you want to hear about my favorite little easy business finance tool, you can go to my website, sarahannphoto.com forward slash course, and it will have a freebie in there. It's called the bucket method. It's the way that I've managed my business and my personal finances to revolutionize how I manage my money. It allowed me to buy a house. It allowed me to buy my husband a car. It allowed us to go on vacation while still paying all of our normal monthly payments, including student loans, um, while building my business and reinvesting in it. So um, again, if you guys want to hear more about me, sarahannphoto.com or sarah underscore Ann underscore photo on Instagram, slide into the DMs. I am happy to answer any questions. Um, currently, the mastermind that I mentioned is actually one that I am in. I'm not oh, hosting okay. one. Oh, in- okay. <laughs> I thought you hosted yeah. that one. <laughs> No, I'm hosting one in the fall and more information will come out about that then. Um, but I'm currently in one because I also value education for myself. So 100%. it's in a group of people. So it's a group of, of business owners and we're all doing major launches in the next six months. And so our coach is coaching us through that process. And so that's really fun and exciting and terrifying yeah. and we love it. Um, <laughs> So uh, also, I guess as a business owner, like don't ever stop educating yourself. Like this landscape changes all the time. So you got to make sure you're going with it. Yeah. And it's just good to, to go through that, those trenches with, um, with other people and and entrepreneurship can be very lonely, but it doesn't have to be. So I've been a part of, um, many masterminds in the past and they're just the best. They're so great. Well, thank you. And then you usually end up with a lifelong friend. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I, I have some really good friends that I made in the, Can- the Canadian area, the Canada area that I haven't gotten to see in, in two years. And we've gotten to this point where it's like, if we call each other, we have to be prepared to be sad because it's, we miss each other so much and texting is one thing, but then like seeing their faces, it just, but anyway, all this to say that the, the connections are so powerful in these kind of these groups of, of people who are just working on the same similar goal of building the business to, to the best that they can be. Um, thank you so much for all of your advice, all of your tips, all of your tricks, all of your wisdom, all of your insights. They are super, super valuable. And I'll put all those links that you mentioned in the show notes, but thank you again. And I have a feeling I'll be asking you a bunch of wedding questions in the future. Oh, anytime that the DMs are also open for you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye.